Good afternoon. I'm Tom Collins, Neubauer Family Executive Director and President of the Barnes Foundation, and I am delighted to welcome you to this special online program featuring groundbreaking collector Sheldon Bonovitz in conversation with Dr. Nancy Ierson, the Barnes Deputy Director for Collections and Exhibitions and Gunn Family Chief Curator. Sheldon and his spouse, Jill, herself a wonderful artist, have been mainstays of Philadelphia's cultural scene for decades, championing self-taught artists and supporting countless individuals and institutions through their progressive arts philanthropy in the city and the region. Sheldon is currently a trustee of several not-for-profit organizations, including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and he has served on the Barnes Foundation Board since 2005, an important force behind our recent evolution and growth. Sheldon and Jill have shared a passion for the arts and arts education since first meeting. Jelly credits Jill, the daughter of iconic Philadelphia gallerist Janet Fleischer, with introducing him to outsider art at a time when few paid it serious attention. And together, they've built one of the world's truly great collections. Sheldon and Jill are equally passionate about sharing their collection with the public at large. They frequently open their home, uh, to tours for people of all backgrounds and knowledge levels. Sheldon has installed art throughout the law offices of Duane Morris, where he serves as chairman emeritus and gives an inspiring tour not to be missed if you have the opportunity. And in a crowning act of generosity, Sheldon and Jill have promised more than 200 works by outsider artists, to the Philadelphia Museum of Art. The catalog for an exhibition of this gift titled Great and Mighty Things has become a go-to resource in the field. Finally, on a personal note, I want to acknowledge that Sheldon and Jill have been great friends, not only to the Barnes Foundation, but to me personally, and I am most grateful to them both. And now it's my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague, Nancy Ierson, who will interview our special guest, Sheldon Bonifitz. Nancy? <laughs> Thank you, Tom, and welcome. Um, before we begin, uh, just a quick reminder that this program will be available on our YouTube channel. So uh, please put it on to friends and family once you've, you've listened to our talk this afternoon. Um, if there is time at the end, we will have a little time for questions. So please put those in the chat and we will get to them if we can. Um, and just to really to say welcome again, Shelley. We're so pleased to, to have you with us. Um, I can't wait to, to get into to the questions with you this evening. And, and thank you also for your wonderful support of Elijah Pierce's America. It really does mean a great deal to us. Now, um, <laughs> let's just leave then. <laughs> We're live. <laughs> and you're in the galleries, right. which is even better. <laughs> I just want to thank uh, Tom for that gracious introduction. And thank you, Nancy. And I uh, enjoyed our conversation. And, and I'm sure I'll learn something by the questions you, with questions you ask me. <laughs> um, well, that's, um, so let's just leap in, Shelley. Uh, you and Jill are often called collectors of outsider art. What do you make of that label? Uh, well, first, let's talk about the characteristics of outsider artists, Nancy. Um, they uh, are untrained. They've had no formal training in art. They are created the art with a view without a view to selling it they created at different ages uh, one of the artists created art from the time he was a child another when it was in his 70s or 80s um, they used often used found materials they were often from the uh, underserved population and many of them were uh, minorities particularly african african americans um, and the most important thing is you judge the quality of the outsider artist by the same standards you've used to a trained artist. And what we have on the screen, uh, guests or visitors, who is the untrained artist? Invariably, they'll say Roy DeForest. Uh, because of the squiggly images and strange faces and the in the in the uh, composition of the of the artwork, but Roy DeForest is the trained artist, not the untrained artist. He 
graduated from college. He had a master's degree in uh, fine art, in art. He taught art at UC Davis and uh, is a well-known contemporary artist in museum collections and been represented by some major galleries. Purvis Young, Purvis Young on the other hand, um, what lived in the mean streets of Overtown, which is outside of, which is part of Miami. He was almost a street person, uh, had no formal training whatsoever, uh, obsessively c created his art initially on the streets of Miami. He painted billboards, um, fences, anything he could find. He was really a wonderfully obsessive artist. But you look at these two works and you can see the Maturation in, in, in Purvis Young's work, and he is in today major museums and also in major. Uh, in terms of the name, which is the question you asked me. Uh, I've learned to accept what the public, how the public would describe the art, and this was hit home to me when we had our uh, the catalog of our own uh, show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Um, the catalog, when it went to the University Press, was captioned um, "Great and Mighty Things." Uh, art from the collection of Jill and Sheldon Bonovitz. And the uh, University Press advised the PMA that if they could describe the work more fully, they'd probably double the distribution. And so we added the word outsider, and it was great and mighty things, outsider art from the collection of Jill and Sheldon Bonovitz, and it did enhance the, uh, the distribution. So I've really learned to accept how people perceive the art and uh, it doesn't really, you know, bother me at all. <laughs> that's, uh, that's a great answer. Um, now, you've known Elijah Pierce's work far longer than I have. Um, you have lent some wonderful pieces to the exhibition. Um, could you tell us about a few that, that stand out for you as collectors? Um, well, first, let me compliment you. Terrific. And one thing that impressed me was uh, you almost started from ground zero in terms of Pierce, and uh, you really you got so deeply into it. You know much more than I do about Pierce, and I've learned a lot from you about Pierce. Um, um, and also, really, the way you showed the work, the um, uh, the work I Pierce work I like is generally single single story, single composition. You have a lot of beautiful panels in your exhibition. And I, I think if I were, or I will be buying more Pierce, Pierce's, I would now lean as much to uh, panels. Father Time is probably one of my, is my favorite uh, Elijah uh, Pierce. It's probably for me the most refined piece I've seen. Uh, the composition holds together beautifully. The coloration is, you know, great. And it's a an interesting story. He's uh, standing on, a, it looks like the globe. He has a clock in his hand, and it's really to me about mortality. And it, the clock is ticking, and we all have a certain period to be on Earth. And it is, uh, to me, a very moving, dramatic uh, piece, and, and at the same time, a very beautiful piece. Um, whoops, went the wrong way. Uh, this, this another piece is Martin uh, Martin Luther King. Um, he, what a warm, loving face, and you have an angel be, uh, behind him who sort of magnifies the beauty of his own face, and then you have love, which is probably the love of humanity, and his love of humanity, and maybe the love of humanity of uh, um, Martin Luther King. This is probably our most traveled piece. Um, just about any time there's a show of his work, of, of Elijah Pierce's work, um, this piece seems to along um, and uh, we're as you, as I think Tom indicated we're happy to share our work with, and we feel that's one of the obligations of uh, of, pe of collectors such as ourselves um, I just want to point out two pieces um, of uh, Elijah Pierce and what I like about his work is is the color in it and the color seems to work really well uh, in the in in the context of, of his work, and uh, I, and I and we have a number of pieces like his that have um, do accentuate color. In fact, behind me, if you can see it, are a number of pieces of 
of ours that we've loaned to the um, to the show, and uh, they are quite um, quite colorful. If I, I asked Jill the same question, and uh, Jill is a minimalist, and she um, loves these two women carrying flowers. They're about six inches high, and they're on a little shelf in a, on a desk in our uh, in our living room. I think she would say I, I warmed up to Pierce much more so than um, she did, but I do think at this point we have a shared love of his uh, of his work. They're really charming, and um, and I, I I'm glad that you have some pieces still at home that you can enjoy while while. The, uh, the rest are in the gallery. It's, it's great to see the, the ones behind you for sure. Um, now, I know that Pierce was one of the artists that set you and Jill on your journey as collectors. Could you tell us a little bit about that, how that happened? Well, as I think as Tom indicated when he, uh, in his remarks, uh, actually Jill and I were married in uh, 1967. And uh, we came from diverse backgrounds, couldn't be any more diverse than one could be in the art world. Jill's mother had a gallery in Philadelphia where she sold uh, work, including work by some outsiders very early on. And she also had a gallery in Paris, Gallery Philadelphia, and she bought work directly from uh, uh, Calder, directly from Picasso. And Jill grew up with artists like them in her, in, in her uh, in her home, I grew up with bare walls and it came from a different uh, background when it came to art. Uh, I did learn a little bit about it when I went to uh, college and took some art courses. So when I married Jill though, I think she was the influencing factor in our uh, going to museums and galleries from the time we were married. And we b began to buy work uh, and, and some, out, some outsider material. And then in 1982, we went to a show at the Corcoran Gallery in Washington. It was called Black Folk Art in America. And uh, it, it featured uh, 19 uh, uh, African-American artists that the curators felt were the important artists that should be shown in a, in a major setting. Uh, we were totally blown away by the show. and. Uh, I think it probably inspired us to collect the material, but I, I, I must say it wasn't like Eureka, this is something we should do. It was frankly sub, subconscious. And, and recently um, I was thinking about what did inspire us. We have a show of our work uh, in 2023 by the PMA. And I thought, well, what would be a great theme? An interesting theme would be work from our collection that was inspired by the Black Folk Art in America show. And we, we have anywhere from five to 25 pieces of work by the, happenly, in, of the major artists in the, in, the, uh, in the Black Folk Art in America show. The first image is of William Edmondson, uh, who created amazing sculptures out of uh, limestone. I, this is, it's a horse. I think it looks as much like a sphinx in a in a in a, in a way. Uh, it, he was uh, as he had various jobs. He was operating a, actually a stone quarry. I think when he um, when he had a vision from God to tell him to create funeral monuments, uh, which he did, and uh, uh, he's one of my favorite, if not my most favorite, artists. Uh, Bill Trailer is another artist who's. Uh, uh, a major figure in the art world today. He uh, was born on the trailer plantation in the early 1850s and migrated to Mobile, Alabama. And in nine, between 1939 and 1942, he created these amazing images of, uh, of, uh, of figures and uh, of both human figures and, and, and animals as, as well. Um, and fortunately for the art world, an artist named William Shannon, who was a trained artist used to buy Bill Trailer's work for his lunch money or uh, maybe exchanging art. So when uh, over a period of three years, he had about other works of his, which event eventually were disseminated to the, uh, to the public. Uh, Joseph Yoakum uh, is an artist who uh, lived in Chicago. He um, said, claimed he traveled with the John Ringley North 
circus and influ and a lot of the work he did was referential to a lot of the travels he as that he uh, that he made. Um, if his work is um, from a distance, a landscape up close, it's very organic. Uh, this is a piece by Sam Doyle. It's uh, he would say it's his civil rights piece. It's called, uh, as you can see, Nancy and Sam Slave. I, I, this was installed in our office in a common area, and I was concerned when I did it that it, people might object to it, but they seem to like it and love it. So it's it's there. Um, and he only worked on on uh, on metal when he did his paintings. Uh, this is a, a piece by Sister Gertrude Morgan. She was a, a, a an amazing figure in the uh, African community in, in Louisiana. She uh, recorded music. She was a preacher, and her painting is very colorful. There's always generally an image of S Sister Gertrude with um, with Jesus. You can see it in, the, in here in the, in the picture, and a lot of her work has to do with going to Jerusalem or some part of uh, some part of Jerusalem. Jill, I think, reminded me that uh, her uh, exhibit at the Black Folk Art in America show was the most striking because the, the, the room, the separate room was all white and then you had these very strong uh, figures in them. Now, this is a piece by uh, David Butler. David Butler lived in the South, um, created a lot of, of pieces out of metal. He'd have them in, in his garden and people would be coming up and buying uh, work from his garden. Incidentally, Jill and I never bought work from the artist directly. We generally bought, we bought work through you know, galleries, private dealers, auction, but uh, over time, but not from the artists. Um, uh, this is Elijah Pierce. He was in the show. Uh, uh, this is a, a loving couple. Uh, the flowers are really a signature piece of a lot of Pierce's work. And at home, we have a actually a, a, a freestanding sculpture of a flower. And then we have a little flower, Pierce flower hanging on a, on a wall. But I think this is a really beautiful piece. And uh, this is a, the last artist uh, is a, a Mose Tolliver, who um, uh, also was from the South. And uh, it's what's interesting is, and uh, artists like Bill Trailer and William Edmondson, I like a hundred percent of their work. But Mose Tolliver, I might like five percent of his work. Uh, it varies depending upon your own tastes and predilections. Um, so that that's just really the story of what what inspired inspired us and uh, uh, and started us on our major part of our journey. I do wish I could have seen that exhibition. It, it sounds really amazing. Um, just such a, an incredible array of artists and, and wonderful that you've been able to to get so many works by them. Um, now, you did touch on, on William Edmondson and I'm very grateful to you, Shelley, for actually having introduced me to, to Edmondson's work. Could you tell me how you and Jill have managed to acquire so many really great pieces? Um, well, let me, let's me let talk a little bit about Edmondson first. Um, he was the first, first, first African-American artist to have a one-person show at the uh, Museum of Modern Art. This was in uh, 1937, and Alfred Barr was the director. Uh, he loved the work, and he wanted to buy the work for the museum, which you know, uh, if the prices were on the work, they were probably six dollars, eight dollars, ten dollars, and the board thought he was crazy and wouldn't allow it. Uh, if uh, and uh, today, I think last a few years ago, Momo bought one piece that for a multiple, very high price, in, certainly in comparison, and uh, was is, was a little maybe a little late in the game in collecting. Anyway, uh, he was and Pierce. Uh, excuse me. Uh, Edmondson was called the Black Mancusi because he worked in limestone. And uh, actually, I thought an interesting show would be uh, showing Brancusi's limestone with uh, Edmondson's uh, uh, limestone. Um, on the right side is uh, the same horse I showed before. And uh, looking at the two pieces, uh, I guess on the left, what uh, how it reminds me how important venue is. Um, uh, I, uh, what Jill and I went to the went to Sotheby's to see some art that was being offered at auction. This is sometime uh, quite a while ago, and this 
poor pony was in the corner, half his ear was off, looked, didn't look very good. And also, and in the day of the auction, it was storming. So anyway, I, I did buy the piece. And because we had the horse, I thought I'd sell it. So, um, which I rarely do. And I we had it conserved, had the year put up, conserved, and uh, and offered it uh, for sale at some multiple of what I paid for it. In the meantime, we put it in, a, in our bedroom in a, in a venue, and it was there for about two or three years. And while a, another piece of art was being installed in the um, in our living room, we said, well, let's move that piece to the living room. And we had to have a dolly to do it because it was so heavy. And when we put it there, it was just perfect. And actually the true test came three weeks later when we were, when we, somebody offered to buy it at the price we were asking, we turned it down because the venue was so, you know, so perfect for it. Um, and then this is a standing woman. This is another one where I desperately tried to sell it and then we put it in the right place in our house and we'd never sell it. So, you know, maybe I'm being superficial or whatever, but a venue for me is a very important part of how work, uh, how I can appreciate, uh, appreciate work. Uh, stop there. So that's the that's story. Any, if you have any, I'm glad you like Edmonds. And he's, he's, he's my favorite, as I say, my favorite art, you know, artist and an amazing, uh, amazing. Sculptor. I think he's extraordinary. I mean, just um, so visually so strong. How many, how many works do you have by Edmonds and Shelley? Pardon? Uh, how, how many, how many Edmonds? About uh, nine. Wow. But who's counting? That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, actually, there are only 160 in, in existence and about probably more than half are at the Cheekwood Museum, which is in Nashville, where Edmondson, uh, uh, you know, worked. I'll have to put that on my list for when the travel becomes possible again. <laughs> now, I'm going to go a little off the uh, off the topic of tonight, but I know Thomas, um, yeah, Tom Collins, our director, just touched on your activity within the city and lots of Philadelphians don't realize that you were responsible for bringing the wonderful Roy Lichtenstein brushstrokes to uh yeah to the the center the, the part that's outside of the Dwayne Reed of uh, the Dwayne Morris offices <laughs> Sorry. um could you tell us a little bit about that sure um well it, this um in, our, in our, about 2002 or three we decided to move from a class A building, which was directly across the street from the building you see, to this building, the, which is, was then called the United Plaza. And uh, I would say we went from a class A building to a class B building, um, but it was a terrific building and we, we learned to love it. And the, in, the entrance to the, to the building was, oh, was like some asphalt, and you'd walk right into a furniture store and our firm took over the food service on the ground floor and we negotiated with the language a landlord to cl and close the space and um so our uh, people in the building who were eating uh eating could sit outside in nice weather and uh, i thought gee a, a sculpture would be great for that space and uh and I, when, I, I, when I mentioned this to Alice Beamdurfer, Beamsdurfer, who was at the PMA and uh, worked very closely with then the beloved director, Ann Darncourt, she mentioned that the Lichtenstein Foundation was interested in having a piece shown in Philadelphia, and maybe they would be interested in showing it in this space, and uh, which they decided to do. And so we had uh, the Lichtenstein uh, piece on brushstroke on loan for really an indefinite period it's from 1905 to today, it's been in, uh, installed there and it's become iconic for Philadelphia, I think. And uh, interestingly, that green brushstroke is freestanding. And when the installer came he, to install it and we had to close off the street and everything, he was concerned, well, how's that gonna really stabilize? Well, below that grassy area is a roof of a garage. So everything is bolted into the garage. And it's uh, so it's been a great setting and it's stayed very, Stable. Everybody liked it, but Inga Safran, who was the art, architecture critic, and she thought it was horrible to enclose a what she deemed to be a public space. And when I learned of this, I thought, well, I'll meet with her in Charmer, and I can convince her that this is not the case. Well, I was very unsuccessful. She wrote a scathing article 
about the piece. And the worst part was, the worst part was that there was some work being done on, on the grassy area and you know when we had just moved in and so there was like barbed wire around the piece so it looked like it was in some kind of prison it was, anyway i i know i have an idea about how what you of it today but it's i think it's a public art and it is public art and it is open to the public at the same time as we were uh, uh as i negotiated with the landlord to get this space we also want i also negotiated uh to get the art in our our lobby done uh, by us uh, by me and uh, I, and he said, and he was concerned about it. And I said, well, your art that's there right now looks like crap. So I mean, you know, you, you, we really have some have some good ideas. And he uh, he said, and he agreed. And uh, so we uh, these textiles are about eight feet long or nine feet long, about three feet high, and the walls are like faux granite. So we have and we put these textiles on the wall, and they're still there. They're beautiful. Nobody, but everybody loves them and they'll re be there indefinitely. But the landlord was so concerned, we have a provision in the lease that if tenants occupy more than 50% of the space we don't occupy, object to the art, then we would we could either change the art or give up the right to, you know, uh, to have it installed. And it's really quite, quite fabulous there. And we also gave a group to uh, the Curtis Institute of Music. It's in the, on their concourse there. And we gave the balance of the work and some other uh, full car, uh, musical full cars to um, uh, the PMA and had a show of the, of the work uh, oh, about five, four or five years ago, maybe a little longer. What do what do the employees and and Dwayne Morris feel about having the art in the spaces? I mean, it is really extraordinary if if you do go into the Dwayne Morris offices, you you really do have an exhibition on the walls. Yeah. Well, some people would say extraordinary. Some people might use other adjectives. Uh, this is a uh, this is a, a planta, which is also from India, as were the fulkaris. Uh, there, these both the fulkaris and the contas are one of a kind, hand embroidered, uh, and uh, with the contas, women took threads from their saris, and on the on, on cloth would create these amazing images. Um, and it was done by the families would do it. All the, the women in a household would do it. And it was done by various casts. It wasn't done by any one cast. And uh, a friend of ours, uh, Scott Rothstein, who was living in India and is an artist himself, s suggested, brought a, a few of them to uh, our house when he was visiting. Uh, he was from Santa Fe, but he was, as I said, was living in India. And he said, I think these these textiles would affect, you know, really if, uh, are like it would appeal to your sensibilities and it did and I, you know I'm sort of like a con I'm the consumer Jill doesn't have to have our she never thinks about buying it although she does enjoy it uh, when I do and she doesn't restrain me thank God so um, uh, I said Scott why don't we get about 40 of them he said well I'm not sure we can but to make a long story short uh, we did get uh, quite a collection um, we uh, went to India and uh, uh, bought some more contas and some of the Bokaris you saw. And these also were uh, given to the Philadelphia Museum of Art and are part of its uh, collection. But at the time, uh, I had all of these, all of the contas hung on a floor and they were spectacular. And uh, there were probably about 30 of them. And uh, Jill happened to be on the floor uh, with a couple lawyers who walked on the elevator. Um, with Jill, didn't know Jill. I hope they didn't know Jill. I don't know. They didn't know Jill. And uh, they said, what the F is he doing now? And I, you know, so that was one, <laughs> one reaction. Um, but overall, I have to say it's become iconic in the, uh, in the firm. And as Tom, and we do have tours of the work and the lawyers like it. And they actually, you know, they're aware now, the lawyers and staff, that we have some of the Elijah Pierce's, including Martin Luther King, who what are hanging in, uh, we're hanging in our office are now in this show and we invited the staff and the lawyers to come to the, see the exhibit uh, as our uh, as our guests. Uh, this is one of the, well, the interesting thing is, uh, I think great art shows well with all types of art and this is really, uh, un, you know, not usual in a corporate setting and this, and yet the work looks great and uh, does resonate with people. This is 
This piece is about 10 feet long, about three or four feet high, uh, by John Searle. Um, and uh, I, uh, th when, we, when I first saw the piece, it was in a gallery, in a Kevin Morris gallery in New York. And we went back to the gallery a few times, and it was in this closet that was no bigger than this, this um, than the piece. And, uh, and uh, Jill was skeptical about it, and I loved, seemed to like it. So I said to the, I think, Sherry, why don't you send it to Philadelphia? We don't like it. I'll send it back and I'll pay all the shipping. Well, of course, once it was hung, it's been there for 15 years and it looks <laughs> great. This is a work by Howard Finster, who was a minister and wasn't getting the min his ministry of his message across as a minister. So he did a lot of messagey work. And he also did work of very famous personage. This is a tribute to the Henry Ford, the Ford family. Howard's in that little car and uh, the members of the Ford family are behind it. And like a lot of the self-taught artists or outsider artists, he painted the frame of the work. Um, this is a, a work, another work by Pur Purvis Young. Uh, Purvis would say he writes of the uh, paints of the human condition, and he really all he can do is paint, and he feels helpless because that's all he can do. He was in jail for a few years, and I guess uh, this obviously is reminiscent of him in jail, and it's called Jail Was He. Uh, and you can see how crude the the, the outline is of just wood hammered together, but it, the piece holds up. It's just, uh, he's an incredible artist and uh, he's gotten a lot of notoriety late, lately. And uh, uh, he, the Rubel Museum had a huge show of his and the Met just had a, a piece of his install uh, up for a while. So he's become very, you know, mainstream and just a tribute to the genius of these artists. Uh, this is a work by an artist named Simon Sparrow, who um, uh, was from the islands, uh, but was living in Wisconsin. It, it's of found objects, and they're, um, you can see, it's very religious. Uh, and uh, very, obviously very colorful. Um, it weighs about 400 pounds and is about 10 feet long and about three or four feet high. And I had to put it in my conference room because in the, uh, the common area, people would pick at it and things would fall off. And I'm not, you know, it's just sort of it's very tactile. Um, so you see it's very, it's very religious and very African. And it's a, an amazing piece. And I met Simon and uh, uh, in the catalogs, a picture of him and me, which is really kind of cute. And he, uh, he couldn't begin to tell you how he did the work. This is a... Um, work by uh, William Hawkins. This is the first, probably one of the first pieces I bought. And his, he always signed his work, William Hawkins, born in Kentucky in July 27th, 1895. He started doing his work when he was in his 80s, I think, or 70s. And he um, uh, lived in Columbus and did a lot of the buildings uh, in, in Columbus. This is a, the Yako building. And actually, I bought this piece, and it was like a folk art store. And at the time I bought the piece, you know, there weren't many galleries, uh, if any, selling this work exclusively, maybe, maybe in New York one. Um, and so if you looked at the whole spectrum of the, of the period of the, this, of the outsider art acceptance in the public world or, or market, um, it went from no galleries or to a number of galleries and now to no, virtually no galleries can make a living selling the material because there just isn't the material. Um, at the same time, uh, the museum and scholarly interest is picked up immensely, and these uh, and the and the work, a lot of the work, is shown in mainstream galleries. Um, so that's that's sort of my uh, story of our, our law firm. I, I, the the uh, chairman of our firm, Matt Taylor, asked me if I, th I he wasn't being ghoulish. He said, well, "What when you're not here? What's going to happen to the collection?" And I. I didn't really think about it, but I thought, well, if Jill's around, certainly during her lifetime, maybe it can stay there because it, it really is a, a, a nice thing for the firm to have, a nice thing for people to see. And um, we, the ultimate disposition could, can't await something. So, Matt, if you're listening, you can relax. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it really is it's wonderful to, to see the pieces in that environment, I have to say. Now, a couple of the works that you showed us, uh, the Finster, for instance, um, 
it clearly have spiritual subject matter. And it struck me that a lot of the artists that you collect do that, that they are deeply evangelical. Um, there's often uh, yeah, a really deep Christian content to it. Is that something that you're struck by? Um, whoops, I went the wrong way. Uh, the, you know, the answer, you asked me this question, we were chatting about this, and you know, the answer, I, I really don't think about the, re the religious aspects of it at all. It's really the, the image and how it you know, fits with, suits me. Um, uh, I, 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 uh, I, I, you know, I'm not a religious, I'm not a religious person, not, and uh, it just doesn't, doesn't strike me. I don't think of it in terms of, hey, it's religious, it's something that's meaningful. Uh, to me, this is a huge piece. It's about eight feet high, um, and it's a very messagey thing, which which is which is what Finster has tried to do in terms of getting the, his uh, his uh, gospel out. Um, I'm thinking about you know the way I look at art is um, it's almost like Ma Malcolm Gladwell's Blink. I don't know if you read that. It's you know in ten seconds you make a decision and generally it's the right decision. And visually, I see something and I like it, you know, and then I'll maybe go deeper into the learning a little bit about the artist uh, and maybe buy more of the artist's work. But it's a, for me, a very visceral, visual kind of a thing. Oops. Oh, so this is, uh, again, another Finster, St. John the Baptist. And again, it doesn't really relate to uh, any of my own personal feelings. Then Sister Gertrude Morgan, again, this is just Sister Gertrude in the middle. It's amazingly colorful work. I, I, I tend to like work that's pretty strong, very painterly. And again, to be able to hit that composition is, you know, it's a bullseye. Uh, here's another work of hers with uh, Sister Gertrude in Christ. This is a, uh, again, you can see the religiousity in it. And then of course there's a, uh, an Elijah Pierce, uh, and as you, I think, as you noted, we have a lot of pierces that are religious, but they're not, you know, not, uh, not in any way reflect our interest in religion. Not just a little sidelight. Uh, when our first son Christopher was born, we named him Christopher, and uh, my father, who was Jew we know, Jewish, and we're Jewish, and he said, "Well, you know, why'd you name him?" Christopher, I said, well, we didn't give any thought, you know, and he was a little put off by it. Maybe more put off than our second son, was named Eric with a K, and that also hit him. And then uh, I saw, I said, well, we were redeemed because we, we, we got our dog, we inherited from somebody whose name was Sarah, and that was my grandmother's name. So I teased him about that. So we had somebody in the family who came after. Uh, so I mean, I, I just the, people, yeah, we move on, Kelly. I, I hope you don't mind me teasing out a story that you told me. Um, but it really um, helped me to understand, I think, a little bit about your your kind of attitude to collecting and, and how you, you're quite relaxed about the terms that people use. It was about you and an experience when you, uh, you were in service. Yeah, you know, uh, yeah, that was, uh, I would, after my, I graduated from law school, I went into a, this is into, into the Army Reserves and was in Fort Sill, Oklahoma at, at advanced artillery training, which was not my cup of tea, but I was there. And uh, I noticed on the barracks uh, wall uh, an invitation from families in Norman, Oklahoma to invite Jewish uh, uh, soldiers, Jewish soldiers to their homes for the high, 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 high holy days. And I thought, well, great, I can get out of going to uh, whatever it is on, on the, at the base, and I'll sign up. So I signed up, and then the commander of the base came to see me and said, you can't go. And I said, what do you mean I can't go? And he said, well, on your dog tags, you have agnostic. And I said, well, you know, that, that's, that's sort of a religious thing, but, uh, you know, ethnically, I'm, I'm Jewish and consider myself Jewish. It would be very important for me to go, gilding it a little bit. So he said, well, you have to go see the rabbi on the base. So I went to see the rabbi on the base, and he said, okay, you can go, but you have to come back and talk to the congregation about your religious beliefs. So I went to Norman, Oklahoma for the weekend, 
had a delightful time, came back the next uh, Saturday, I spoke to the congregation, who were surprisingly very, a very religious group. And I think if they allowed stoning in those they, in the days when I was speaking, I could have been stoned. They didn't take to my beliefs and views, but uh, that was like, you know, again, it was a public, it's a perception. You're, you know, and I could accept that. So I've never, even though I'm not religious, I always, uh, I'm Jewish, you know, same thing. That, That's, um, no, thank you for sharing that. It's, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's quite thought provoking. Um, now, a lot of the artists that you've, you've mentioned this evening and um, this afternoon are people like Bill Trailer, who have become incredibly sought after uh, on the on the art market. Um, is that gratifying to see artist prices rise? Um, it's um... In a way, it is gratifying because it, 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 it indicates an acceptance of the quality of the art and the art that has been accepted and has been a crossover and is important in the general art world uh, are, are some of the great artists. Edmondson is one I mentioned his show at uh, MoMA. He also, he's been in a number of shows. One that was particularly striking was one at the DeMille De Foundation, a, a Edmondson trailer show that was just uh, spectacular. Uh, James Castle is a, another one. Uh, he worked particularly in uh, found material, soot, spit, uh, a stick was his drawing, the way he drew, string, paper. And uh, he, he did an amazing, uh, he had a, he's an amazing artist. Now, this is probably one of Jill's uh, uh, favorite pieces, it's a double-sided uh, uh, picture. And here's a chair uh, with this, you can see the string and uh, the, uh, the, the, the outline of the chair. Uh, he really is an amazing uh, artist. Uh, he had a one-person show at the Philadelphia Museum of Art. Uh, and actually, our, our, uh, found, our foundation, which is a foundation for self-taught artists, although now we, we would probably call it outsider artists, um, uh, did a film. And Ann Percy, who created this castle show, went on the shoot before she finished curating the show. And when she came back, I think she would admit that her experience in doing the seeing work going to the shoots influenced the way she curated the show um and it was a great great show and it, it, we also did a film about castle and that was in the uh, that was in the catalog so and it was the first time i think that the university press had put a film of uh, a dvd in the catalog with you know of of a, of a work in a major museum uh, martin ramirez is another uh, major artist in the field um he was born as, uh, in, in, in Mexico in 1885, migrated to uh, California in about 1815, worked on the railroad chain gangs there work, uh, as a day laborer. And in, in uh, 1930 was institutionalized in, a, in Sacramento and uh, in an institution there and was certified schizophrenic. And while he was there, he did some uh, drawings on paper that he had and put it together somehow and smuggled it to the, uh, the uh, psychiatrist uh, in, named Carmen Pasto. And when Ramirez died, Pasto had about 300 pieces of his work, which were then ultimately disseminated to the, uh, 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 to the public. This is, and Peter Sheldell reviewed his show and said he was one of the greatest, great art, draw, artists of the 20th century. Um, uh, and he's gotten, this is a piece called Dragon Train and uh, it is an amazing piece, um, and I'm, it's about ten, again ten feet long. And you know, I can always I can remember how I bought a piece, how much I paid for it, why I bought it. This is a particularly memorable piece because I was uh, working in New York on the worst case of my life, and living I lived at the literally lived at the Four Seasons Hotel just as it opened for over a month, uh, working on this horrible thing, and. Uh, a private dealer named Karen Lennox called me with a Polaroid of this piece. And I said, Karen, don't bother me. I'm working, you know, see me and whenever this is done. And every day she'd send me, pest call me and she would, and Jill wouldn't go see the piece. 
And finally, which she's, you know, with this, what a, not all dealers would do, do this, would say, well, look, if you don't like it, I'll sell it and you'll get your money back, I guarantee it or whatever. I said, okay, now I really ought to just get trying to get rid of her. I said, okay, send it to us. And once we got it, it, it was just, it's fabulous and we love it. And it's really an important major piece of, of his. And it's been in our living room for, since the time we acquired it. Uh, this is another piece by Bill Trailer. It's a wonderful abstract. Nice in, you know, abstract art. It's fabulous. Um, Bill Trailer, the, uh, the Smithsonian had a, a great show of uh, Bill Trailer a couple, couple years ago. And uh, uh, Peter Sheldahl, again, who reviewed the show, loved it. So, you know, what a great, he's a, attributed to be the, a really great, he attributed uh, Trailer as being a really great artist. Um, and then here's another. Uh, trailer. This is uh, probably Jill's favorite piece. Um, you know, it's interesting that when, it, 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 when you talk about real estate, it's always location, location, location. It's always if you, you know, buy the best piece of work, most often, the best isn't necessarily the most expensive, but you, you, it generally, you know, appreciates it. Anyway, this was at Herschel and Adler, and I didn't want to buy it because it was a record price and they wouldn't reduce the price by a penny, which I admire, but I didn't. Six months later, we saw it at the Chicago Art Fair, and somebody else was offering the same piece. So I bought it for the same price at the time, and obviously don't regret it. Um, and it, it, I, Jill would probably say this is her favorite piece. Um, this is Joseph, um, Joseph Yoakum. Uh, I mentioned him. He's, uh, <clears throat> he influenced a lot of the Chicago images. Uh, Roger Brown, Ray Yoshida, uh, Carl Worsham, um, they, you know, he was a favorite of theirs. They collected his work. So he was really somebody who influenced their work, I think, they would say. Um, Chicago Art Institute's having a major show of his. Uh, and then I then it's uh, slated to go to MoMA, I understand. Um, here's another um, yoga. I just love his, uh, love his work. Also, uh, Venus Over Manhattan, which is a great New York gallery at a yoga show that... Uh, they sold a lot, and they also, they also had, a, had, I think, exclusively Yoakums at their um, uh, installation in, uh, at Art Basel, Miami, and uh, they, love, they love outsider work, and they love, uh, they love Yoakum. I, uh, I can understand that entirely. It's, uh, it's fantastic work. <laughs> I, um, I can't see the, the Yoakums without thinking of the Art Institute and, um, and Mark Pascal there. He, uh, it's, uh, it's such wonderful work. It's lovely to see yeah, it being so. You work at the Art Institute. That's right, yeah, yeah. And, um, and, um, uh, he was a curator. The James Castle Show went from uh, PMA to, to the Art, Chicago Art Institute, when, and he was the curator of that show at the uh, Art Institute. <laughs> That's uh, yeah, some really good taste. <laughs> uh, but it is interesting, Sheldon, that you have continued to buy the artists that you like, um, even as the market has risen. Um, I think that's that's quite unusual that you've you've kind of followed that journey through. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think uh, you know, fortunately, we were able to do it, and um, there's no, you know, this is what. You know, I love uh, I love doing. Uh, this is really these are some of the images from our show at the PMA in 20, 2013. Uh, I just uh, this is uh, this was on the cover of the catalog, and and uh, the curators are thinking about what to put on the cover. And uh, Timothy Rub Drub, the director, thought, well, we'll put Bafo on the cover. And uh, so I sent a note saying that PMA has gone boffo. Uh, this is a chicken bone tower that was made out of literally chicken bones from these you know, these TV dinners, and uh, it's a little uh, quite interesting. Then this is another Cyril. The birds are very mysterious. Uh, th this was in our show. This is an, you know we had some fairly obscure artists in our show. This is one of them, Bruno Del Favaro. And I, what I like about it, the painting is incredible. The clouds are amazing. I love the crazy perspective. The boats are going upstream. And uh, actually, before the, we opened the show, 
and uh, it was, but the, the curator asked if we were refreshing the show, as, not at the PMA. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, to fill it out. And I said, you know, that would be disingenuous. We're, you know, this, we want, it's really our personal collection. It's not a survey like a museum would have. And that, like there are two notable exceptions um, to, to the great, I'd say the great artists and that we don't have, uh, Henry Darger and uh, Thornton Dial, but it, I think it just reflects the personal tastes of, of collectors. Uh, this is a clock that Howard Finster did, and this is a, it, in very obscure language. You can see the great and mighty things, which is from a, a, a verse of the Bible. Um, so those are the those are sort of the things we had in 2013 at the show. Um, and do you have any favorite memories of that show? So many people saw it and enjoyed it. Um, yeah, uh, well, two things. One, uh, we had about 5,000 kids who school children who came to the, you know, came there and were sprawled on the floor, not, at, not all at once, times. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, it was great seeing them there and engrossed in what they were doing. And this was probably a show that people from five to 95 would, you know, love. And the other thing was uh, a Roberta Smith's uh, review of it. She said, uh, her caption was, um, outside, uh, outsider, outsiders, outsiders, outside not looking in. And it was a reference to the fact that the museum had a great encyclopedic museum had opened its arms to the to the work and it, and it was accepting and it was a great tribute to uh, I think the work and to the installation. The museum did a fantastic uh, installation of it. And then I asked Jill the same question, and she said uh, it was the guards. The guards were loved the show, and when we went there, they would be asking us questions and telling us how much they liked the show. And even after it closed, they yeah, you know, asked us the, you know, they continued talking about the show and telling us how much they liked it. That's really wonderful. It's uh, it's a real, uh, well, I imagine it must be very gratifying to, to see people uh, share that enthusiasm. Now, I I know that you have, you're very, you and Jill have very generously left a, a large part of your collection to the, the PMA. Um, any thoughts about the, uh, the rest of your collection? Well, it's really a, um, it's a journey, you know, sort of like the beginning when we started buying art, then sort of deep into collection, and then there's the exit. And the exit, quite honestly, has been very hard. I, we've given a, a major part of our work to the PMA. Um, my, my thought in doing so, it should be an encyclopedic museum and shown with other work. I thought that was important. And also that would be on their web and be shown in a way that would be visitor uh, visitors international you know, people remotely could watch see the see the work and i'd say that that's been the whole success of that has been very pretty spotty and and i'm not and we have a number of probably several hundred pieces uh, left and i'm really not sure what we're going to do with that work uh give it to a museum uh sell it uh give it to a foundation that our phone foundation and sell it and use the proceeds for our own you know, our own interests. Uh, so it's, it's really an open, it's really an open question. The exit is really, really quite hard. And uh, I haven't, I haven't thought it through, but the important thing is, it's the journey. The journey has mm -hmm. been great. And you can, and uh, Joe and I have had a, an amazing, wonderful time seeing art, acquiring art and sharing art. And uh, it's just a part of our lives. And, uh, it's like almost anything else. It's it's not that the ends justify the means. It's really the means, the journey that is really the important part of all of this. And as the journey continues, are there are there recent acquisitions? I know that you're still looking and, and buying. Yeah, well, you know, we at, bought some Edmondsons actually at the or at the uh, at Christie's in January. Uh, this is a. Uh, a, a, a water fountain, and it sort of tells you something about auctions and how episodic they are. Uh, this was the featured piece in the in the show, and it was priced so expensively I wasn't going to bid on it. And then a, a few days before the um, auction, the estimate below was dropped, and apparently there was not much interest in it, so I bought it. And uh, and then there were two, there was two separate. Uh, offerings of vessels which i thought were great and they were um and each was sold for 10 times the high estimate and i 
I couldn't bring myself to buy them, but I was a little, uh, I wasn't despondent about it. But I said, you know, I thought Jill's an artist. She works in ceramics, like the vessel form. It'd be nice to buy it. Um, and the last offering was an offering of four vessels that were big. And I said, I could, there's no way I could deal with four vessels, so I passed on it. And that night I happened to see a, a, a James Brett, who's a great dealer. He has a museum of everything. He's British, a met, really great collector. And uh, he, he told me, or I knew he had bought the four pieces, and I told him my so, tale of well, and he said, well, I'll share them with you. I said, great. So I bought two of the pieces through through James, uh, and here they are. And uh, they're, they're quite big. They're eight inches or nine inches tall, very thick, uh, very, very, very strong. Yeah, I think they're just uh, they're stunning, and I was so pleased when I discovered that you'd, uh, you'd acquired them. I that's a great choice. <laughs> um, and my last question <laughs> for you is, um, yeah, do you have a favorite piece? Uh, you know, how do you choose? Well, I, I'd say Edmondson is my favorite artist. And then we have this angel um, in our bedroom on a cadenzo. Uh, and the, you know, then again with Blink, I saw this, a Fleischer Ullman, John Ullman had this at his booth and I bought it within 10 seconds of my saying it at least, or maybe sooner. And the face is very angelic and it's very difficult. A lot of his faces are, of women, of angels, are very severe. This is a very angelic face. I've been asked this quite uh, a lot of time. A lot of, whenever I'm interviewed, this is often a popular question. Uh, you know, your favorite piece. And uh, some time ago I said, yeah, this is my favorite piece. The angels on my, our cadence in our bedroom. So at night I sleep with two angels and uh, I said that. <laughs> I've said that any number of times. Uh, when it's... <laughs> that's so that's, that, that's, that's the story <laughs> of our collection. Um, no, it's, just, it's just so rich and, and so wonderful, Sheldon. I mean, I, uh, I could talk about your, your collection all day. And we do have a, a couple of questions here that I, I just wanted to squeeze in at the end. Um, and I'm just going to read here. As outsiders, were any of the artists that you've shown us influenced by more inside artists? So is there a sort of cross exchange there? Yeah, um, not that I'm aware of. I think the, the frame of reference of the artist was their own experience or what, what they saw within themselves. Uh, uh, I can't think of an artist who was influenced um, you know, by trained artists. I, I would say that some of the outside artists may have trained, may have influenced uh, trained artists because the trained artists learned about them and, you know, worked with them by acquiring them. So I think it went the other way. I think Joachim is, is one who is a good example that I mentioned. That's a good thought. Um, and here we go. I, there's a comment here. Um, I didn't hear Sheldon mention the pieces they donated to the school district of Philadelphia. Oh, um, <laughs> my my uh, a Purv this is a Purvis Young uh, was his Purvis's Young's work was managed brilliantly by an art a gallery uh, uh, a gallerist named Joy Moose in, in Florida and his work was Car Carson Grev probably has one of the major galleries in the world was selling his work at very good prices. And one day my mother-in-law got a call from Joy and said, I'm being sued by Purvis Young and I have to settle, I have to sell two warehouses full of work. And uh, uh, so, you know, I talked to my mother-in-law, negotiated the deal with uh, his lawyer and uh, we bought the work. And, uh, you know, and we're, we had it, we've had it for the, my mother-in-law's galleries, uh, been closed for probably 15 years and we have but we have a reservoir of work there and we have all this per, all these purpose youngs and i thought well what better way of making gifts than to give it to the public school kids in philadelphia so we we gave five works of purposes to 130 public schools and uh and we and the pma did a wonderful uh poster of Purvis describing his work and then questions were asked that could relate to kids who are pretty young to high schoolers. And it's a picture, and also a picture of Purvis and the jail and the feature uh, picture is uh, jail was heat. And uh, 
uh, that was a really nice nice thing to uh, to do, and and uh, the kids really I think uh, liked it, and, and uh, the fellow who did this did all the logistics, which was incredible. Incredible. Matt who works at the Fleischer Allman Gallery. Matt Lukash did a great great job, and we've given uh, some purposes. We gave it to the Bell Museum, and they were part, some of them were in the show. We gave a lot of work to uh, the Lincoln University, a black university outside of Philadelphia. So um, we have, you know, been able to give the, give the work away to institutions that um, you can appreciate. In fact, we're giving a major book, I mean, probably the book of all books, to the Smithsonian uh, uh, this year. Um, so it's, uh, it's fun to, it's actually fun to give work away. It's more fun, honestly, to give work away than to sell it. Uh, and I don't mean to be clear about it, but, you know, I, I, I think that you see it being appreciated and uh, uh, it's just very gratifying. Well, that's incredibly good news for the museum community. <laughs> Thank you, Sheldon. And, and really, you know, I mean, I'm, I'm very sad we're, we've run out of time this evening. Um, you know, thank you ever so much for for sharing details of your journey and for and your you know, the wonders that you and Jill have collected with us. And apologies to anybody listening that if I've, if you asked a question and we didn't get around to answering it, um, we love the fact that you're so incredibly engaged. Um, and I'd just like to finish with a, a word of thanks to um, everybody that lent to the Elijah Pierce exhibition. Um, as you know, uh, we will be closed uh, until the end of the year, but there's plenty to see on our website. Um, and we are very hopeful that we will reopen on January the 2nd. So you will have a little chance to come and see the exhibition uh, in the new year. So it's something uh, to look forward to in 2021, along with many other things we hope. Um, as I say, a big thank you to our, our, our lenders, as uh, to our supporters. A shout out to Northern Trust. We are very grateful for, for your involvement. Um, and as I say, please continue to engage with the collection online. And behalf, on behalf of Tom Collins, Everybody at the Barnes, uh, Sheldon and Jill, thank you ever so much for joining us and do take care. <laughs>